Well, I wanted to welcome you all to the Women in Global Health Canadian event. Uh, what we'll be discussing here is um, looking at a gender equal health and care workforce and a new social contract for women. And I wanted to start first by doing a land acknowledgement and to begin by acknowledging uh, my gratitude to live and work on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish. I am very grateful to be here and coming to you from what we now know as Vancouver Island in British Columbia. My name is Deb Lester and I am the co-chair of the Women in Global Health Canada. Uh, I would say from my background, um, my initial degree is in nursing. So I have a real passion for um, women in global health and especially our nursing workforce and what we um, have all um, you know, been working towards in these last years and especially in this um, you know, post uh, COVID time. I have um, had a long career working in, um, in global health and international development and became involved with women in global health um, not long after their inception in 2018 when we looked at forming the Seattle chapter. And then I was lucky as I moved home to Canada to become um, involved with our Canadian chapter. So really, really um, happy to be here with you all today and to be moderating this session. I thought for those of you that are new to women in global health, I would just give you a little um, introduction to um, what the movement is. It was founded in 2015 um, by a group um, of uh, very passionate women um, who are really realizing all of the uh, inequalities um, in global health and experiencing that firsthand and listening to the voices around them. The movement focuses on four key areas of advocacy, so gender equal leadership in global health and going beyond gender parity to gender transformative leadership, gender equity in the health and care workforce, which we'll be discussing today, a gender responsive health systems for universal health coverage and pandemic preparedness and response, and building the women in global health movement and alliances for women's leadership and gender equality in global health. Women in Global Health has 50 chapters worldwide and growing in over 45 countries, over 5,500 members and hundreds of thousands of supporters in over 100 countries. So quite remarkable thinking of uh, that beginning in 2015, which seems not so long ago. It is a global movement. It is a platform for all voices and a catalytic force and a strategic disruptor. And Women in Global Health is in official relations with the World Health Organization. As we all know, COVID-19 is unearthed and exacerbated deeply ingrained gender inequalities with the health and care workforce. In this context, women have been disproportionately affected as they are responsible for the majority of the informal and formal care. At this event for Women in Global Health Canada, we aim to bring a different perspective on the topic of gender equal health workforce and how can a new social contract for women, health and care workers be established. So I'd like to start by introducing one of our first speakers. Um, Dr. Beverly Johnson is a community family physician from Ottawa, Canada. She's the co-chair and co-founder of Women in Global Health Canada and co-chair of the Canadian Women in Global Health Leadership Steering Committee that Women in Global Health Canada is part of. She is the in the leadership of the Federation of Medical Women of Canada and Medical Women's uh, International and a member of the Alliance for Gender uh, Equality and Universal Health Coverage in Ottawa. And she sits on the primary care partner table. And Bev, maybe I could turn it over to you just to speak about um, the crisis in primary care in Canada through a gender lens. Thanks, Deb. And I'm delighted to be here today. And thank you for your introduction, as well as sort of setting the stage about women in global health and about the gender equal health and care workforce, which is uh, such a critical uh, project given what we've all seen in the past few years. Now, I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Okay. Um, so hopefully you can see my slides okay then. So I'm speaking today about the primary care crisis in Canada and what can be assessed through a gender lens. And Deb's kindly given my bio. So prior to COVID-19, 
4.6 million Canadians were without a primary care provider, a family physician. COVID has exacerbated all the already difficult working conditions. In 2022, which was two years into the pandemic, Angus Reid Survey in Canada put the number at about 6 million. So despite there being more physicians before the pandemic. So, so guess, as we talk about the patients without a family physician or primary provider, which in Canada is as well a nurse practitioner, what we're really talking about is the unattached patients, those who don't have a primary care home or primary care provider. So to set the stage a little bit, so women achieved gender equity in medical school in Canada in 1995. By 2030, women physicians will constitute 50% of the practicing physicians. And currently, 54% of women physicians are under the age of 40, a period of life that corresponds to family building. In 2020, 48.5% of women graduates went into family medicine, 38.8% went into the specialties. Once an opportunity for the advancement of women, primary care is in a crisis. There are characterized by systemic failures to co cover population health needs, an underappreciated workforce, and a glass cliff where women are choosing to leave the profession. There has been an exodus from primary care. A few statistics, 17.9% of non-retirement age health workers intend to leave or change their current job in the next three years. Graduates of medical schools choosing family medicine fell from 38.5% in 2015, well before the pandemic, to 31.8% in 2021. This year, we watched as the medical students applied and received their residency spots for their training in Canada. And um, so of the vacant spots in residencies, family medicine accounted for 78%, and almost 100 spots were unfilled in Ontario and Quebec. <laughs> So as a family physician myself, now practicing for nearly 30 years and providing longitudinal care in Ottawa, this is hard to watch. So many of us are, are really, you know, looking to find those solutions that can uh, improve things here for primary care in Canada. And I do have hope and I'll share some of those and I think others will as well, sort of where, where we can... Um, make some changes here. So with the rising wave of women within primary health care, issues of work-life violence related to family building and caregiving roles and pay equity are critical considerations in workforce decision-making and primary care reform. The majority of women are relatively young and in a period of life that corresponds to family building. Women in the primary care workforce who choose to have families are subject to the same gender role expectations as other women in terms of domestic responsibilities. Many find themselves after a busy day at work, you know, caring for the children and the family in the evening and then returning to complete their, their administrative work tasks in the later part of the day, and this is after putting in extended hours in understaffed and overworked healthcare environment. In fact, these family policies that we need to develop our practices support both men and women healthcare providers. So viewing the workforce crisis with a gender lens highlights actions key to strengthening the resilience and the humanity of the primary care profession. So using a gender lens on the crisis in primary care focuses policy development on greater pay, domestic equity, flexible work hours and environment, team-based care and respect for work-life balance. 
the rise of women in healthcare has impacted both the teaching and learning environment, which were designed without consideration of the family or domestic responsibilities of the students or practitioners. Long hours of training and practice are challenging for women balancing domestic and child rearing roles, leading to difficult choices between family and professional life. The COVID-19 pandemic further heightened gender inequalities, affecting the health workforce, provoking a crisis of care for women. Given that women perform three quarters of all domestic duties, many have to juggle these needs at home with the professional pressures of their workplace. It is not surprising that reports of poor mental health and burnout are more prevalent among women. It is with dismay that the healthcare workforce within which women are so crucial is not created to work for them. So it's critical that the needs of women providers are accommodated and supported. So um, many women have exerted their particular practice choices to successfully accommodate child re rearing and non-professional caregiving roles. In light of this so-called feminization of healthcare and the brewing workforce crisis in primary care, it is critical that the needs of women providers are accommodated and supported. This would include a generous maternity and paternity leave and the adoption, as mentioned earlier, of team-based practice are really important first steps. Equally crucial are shifting values, supporting men's domestic and child, men and all genders, domestic and child rearing roles, and making it acceptable to talk about and accommodate family needs and responsibilities for primary care providers. At the same time, efforts around pay equity are needed. Women represent the majority of care workers in Canada, yet continue to be underpaid compared to the men for the same job. So what does this mean for the profession? Quality of care is enhanced as women take more time with patients and prioritize preventative medicine. Patients experience cared for by women experience lower rates of hospitalizations, and women are disruptors for change, pushing for interdisciplinary changes. Women providers are vocal advocates for sex-specific women's health concerns, such as breast and reproductive cancers. We should highlight the absence of women as subjects in health science research. Women healthcare leaders have been shown to expand health coverage, strengthen health service, and prioritize issues such as gender-based violence. Conditions for everyone will improve once we address women's needs and concerns in the primary care profession. Actions include removing structural barriers such as caregiving roles and improving working conditions. These barriers have kept women at the margins and hindered their growth inside and outside the healthcare workforce. However, just when it is even more crucial to encourage women to enter and remain in primary care, it is poised to deteriorate and employed around them. This is the equivalent of a glass cliff for women healthcare providers. Once an opportunity for advancement of women, primary care has become a crisis compounded by systemic failures and an overworked and underappreciated workforce. Gender equity should be central as solutions to the workforce crisis are developed. Key in these efforts are removing barriers affecting women's rights and well being in the health for workforce. Everyone in Canada deserves access to primary care. Training more providers is not the only answer. It is time to boldly redesign our primary care system with the goal of keeping the front door wide open to women. We must rebuild humanity into the primary care workforce and consider what is brought into focus with a gender lens, greater pay, domestic equity, flexible work arrangements, team-based care, and humanity with respect to work-life balance. 
Thank you for your attention. And I'll hand over back to Deb, our moderator. Thanks so much, Bev. Um, and we're going to um, have some time for questions uh, after our speakers are uh, finished. So if you wouldn't mind just going ahead and putting any questions you have in the chat, and then we'll make sure that we can um, get to those um, um, at the end of some of our um, at the end of our um, speaking points here. So next, I would like to introduce Dr. Ivy Bergeau. Uh, who is a professor in the School of Sociological and Anthropological Studies at the University of Ottawa and the University Research Chair in Gender Diversity and the Professions. She leads the Canadian Health Workforce Network and the Empowering Women Leaders in Health Initiative. Dr. Bourgeois has garnered an international reputation for her research on the health workforce, particularly from a gender lens. And Ivy, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Deb. And uh, it's such a pleasure to, to be here and to speak about an issue near and dear to my heart. So thank you so much for that um, opportunity. And my byline is really gender always matters. And so I'm hoping that I can convince you of that in the next uh, few minutes. So one of the first points that I want to make here, uh, and this is boring work from uh, Women in Global Health, of, of whom I'm very pleased to be a member in the Global Health Workforce Network Gender Equity Hub, is a report that was uh, prepared just prior to the pandemic delivered by women led by men. And that gender-based occupational segregation in healthcare is persistent. It has its roots in what is considered to be gender norms and stereotypes about what is women's work, both at work and at home. And this has really important implications. And so when we talk about, you know, occupational segregation, you, you could ask, well, you know, there's a lot of women that work in healthcare, and absolutely they do. But in particular um, sectors of the health workforce, those that are uh, typically considered lower status, lower paid, uh, lower skills. And I think that we need to do a radical reshift of what we think is skilled work in healthcare. So I, I'm a sociologist and uh, I really draw upon sociological theory to, to make some of the cases. And um, uh, Celia Davies talked about this, you know, looking at this historically, that the issue is not so much the exclusion of women from work defined as professional or those more higher status positions within the healthcare division of labor, but rather their routine inclusion or demarcation into ill-defined support roles that are considered more subservient historically. And that has continued, that sort of socialization has continued to this day, despite the fact that you know, nurses, midwives, nurse practitioners are work independently, uh, highly skilled, highly trained, but there's still this notion that they are lesser than. Anne Witts uh, talked about in this incredible historical text called Professions and Patriarchy that gendered actors engaging in professional projects so trying to gain more status and prestige for a profession, they'll have differential access to resources because of their gender. And especially within uh, an, an institutionalized society uh, where um, patriarchy um, is, is structured and organized. So history has legacies and it has implications to this day. So that's why we say occupational segregation is gendered and quite persistently so. Here in Canada, we see that the participation in the health workforce is increasing, but this is dramatically more so for women. So women in the health sector are increasing at a faster pace than men in the health sector in comparison to the Canadian labor force in general represented by the red line. However, you don't see women uh, and men moving into similar jobs. What you find are women going into traditionally masculine occupations. And so here, 99% um, of the midwives uh, identify as women. 99% of dental uh, assistants, dental hygienists, dietitians, general counselors, and nursing is not very far behind at about 95%. On the other hand, those um, professions where men tend to predominate, those who identify as men tend to predominate, medical physicists, paramedics, chiropractors, physicians, dentists. And so you can see how this has changed over time, but not so much of men going into professions that are typically uh, gendered female. 
So there's a very small proportion, um, you know, so when you look at between 1987 and 2016, uh, there's a, a large proportion of men going into licensed practical nurses and psychiatric nursing, but still, you know, at a very persistent 89 and 90 percent. So that's really important to note, such that in Canada, over 85 percent of the health workforce are women, identify as women, which is much greater than the, than the global average. So this has important implications for the gender pay gap. And, uh, and so the pay inequity that we see between professions, the more typical focus is looking at it within an occupations, it's much easier to do that. And I'll talk uh, in, in, a, in a minute about some data from medicine. It's much more difficult to look at it across professions. And that's where you see the impact of the gender segregation uh, within healthcare, very important. So the gender pay gap is particularly large amongst health work. And this is uh, data that uh, was highlighted in the um, delivered by women led by men report looking at American data. So if you look at all of the health workforce taken into consideration the same hours, similar work in similar occupations, each of those things, same work, uh, working hours and occupations are also gendered. But if you, if you say, if you remove those, we still have 11% of unexplained variance in that regard. So let's look at some Canadian data. These are data specific to Ontario um, that were presented in the medical post by Boris Kraut, who has um, since, who used to work with the Ontario Medical Association. So really knows these data well. And he has subsequently done some other work. So you can see a kind of hierarchy in terms of the average male to female payment. So this is about fee for service data. This doesn't include, and women predominate in non fee for service medical specialties or and so when you look at this because sometimes people say well the payment schedule is not gendered but it is it is very much gendered it's gendered in how you utilize the pay um, the fee schedule and where women predominate or do not predominate some of those fees tend to be higher so it's gendered inherently and also the application and you can kind of see that um, and that specialty that she was focusing on in terms of family medicine, there's a differential rate in the middle there of 1.33, okay? But it gets higher, especially in those surgical specialties. Now, taking this, these data across Canada by looking at all of the earnings, not just the fees, but all earnings from family medicine, this is really incredible work. Uh, published in Health Policy by Boris, as well as Daniel O'Toole, Meredith Van Stone, and Arthur Sweetman, colleagues from McMaster University. And so you can see in the percentile distribution for under 50%, the differentials between men and women, um, there's always a differential, but it's much lower. When you get into the upper echelons of earnings, not billings, of physicians, it's much, much higher. So you see far fewer women in the upper echelons of earnings amongst physicians. So these are data for within a profession. This is much easier to compare apples and apples. It becomes much more difficult to compare apples and oranges. You know, and I was uh, one of the expert witnesses on the case for midwifery pay equity and how it was much more challenging and took many years and a court case to make the case for the type of work that midwives do vis-a-vis -vis nurse practitioners and family physicians uh, and how challenging that was. You simply don't have the type of quantitative data that you could do these types of analyses on. Now, why do we see these differences in earnings? Um, in part, you know, because women are distributed amongst the specialties differently and some specialties you know, have greater pay. And it's also about the amount of hours that was noted in the US uh, labor force survey. So women and men do uh, proportionately lower FTEs uh, in, in, uh, in medicine. And this is a trend that is robust across other specialties. An example here is in occupational therapy. So there's a lot of unpaid care work at home. Again, gendered notions of what uh, women do. And a nice piece that came from Women Global Health Women spend uh, between two and 10 times more on unpaid care as compared to men, depending on the country. So this is very robust time series data, very significant. 
in the case of medicine, the last study that was done on this was in, in 2002. So that's 20 years ago, a generation ago. This is data that really do need to be updated. But that um, a physician to identify as men with children under 18 reported an average of 15 hours a week in the home, whereas women, physicians, so physician to identify as women, spent on average 42 hours a week of unpaid work in the home. And in fact, sometimes medicine is chosen as a flexible job, similar to what we find in academia as well. You're flexible, so you have that, you have more time to be able to, um, to spend in this unpaid care work. A really great piece here in the Canadian Journal of Surgery that's looking at a, a solution to gender inequity in surgery. And uh, the, the answer there is highlighted at the end. The answer uh, may at least in part line the field's inability to adequately accommodate caregiving duties, which are still disproportionately women's responsibilities. Although many Canadian academic centers now have paid maternity policies for trainees and faculties, these do not necessarily apply in the case of surgery. So better gender equity, as Bev was mentioning, is really important. And then we get into the health leadership um, and initiatives. And this is the UN High Level Commission on uh, Health uh, Employment and Economic Growth, really talking about institutionalizing leadership because if women are not getting into leadership positions, they are not able to make a case you know, for um, greater gender, uh, gender equity. And so the same challenges in terms of gender segregation and pay inequity are also implying at the leadership level. And it's also really important to note that gender segregation in the health workforce is also transferred in the case of, um, in, in the case of leadership. And so um, gender and health leadership can also mask the occupational segregation at that level. So women may make certain positions often those women who make certain leadership positions are uh, women physicians. And so we need to think about leadership writ large so that it's not just gender of the actual practitioner, but gender of the, um, of the profession. And so um, I want to um, conclude with a point specifically about this uh, is really important in terms of implications of the, the sustainability of the system, as Bev was mentioned, but our, also our economic sustainability. The health sector is one of the top 10 sectors in the Canadian uh, environment. It is the number one place women work, health and social care. And it's a sector that makes up 8% of Canada's GDP uh, using data from uh, 2019. And so this is a place where we should be doing robust health workforce planning to sustain the sector to sustain um, health workers in this sector. And, and we are um, beyond suboptimal in planning in health workforce, it's nearly invisible. And I think that that's very much a gendered issue. So health workforce planning, pay and equity, um, uh, gender-based leadership or leadership within healthcare, occupational segregation, these are all layered gender issues and they all interweave and interconnect. And if we can interrupt this, by acknowledging the gender inequities across each of those layers, we would be much better. So I'll conclude there. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Ivy. That uh, deeply resonates. So, um, and again, please put your questions if there's any in the chat um, so we can hopefully um, have some time for uh, questions and answers. Um, next, I'm going to turn over, I'm very, very pleased to introduce um, Anne Keeling who is a Women in Global Health Senior Fellow um, and is a British citizen and whose 40 year career in global health and social development has included posts all over the world. Uh, and she's um, in her home is in the UK, so including the United Kingdom. She was the head of gender equality policy with the UK government and the chair of the NGO Age International. She's been the CEO of two global health NGOs um, was the United Nations Population Fund Country Representative for Pakistan and Director Commonwealth Secretariat uh, leading on health education and gender. During her nine years in Pakistan with the British Council, United Nations Development Program, the Department for International Development, working on human uh, development and women's rights. So Anne, we're really, really pleased to have you here. And I know as a real integral and founding member of, member of Women in Global Health. So thank you and I'll um, turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Deb. 
and uh, thanks to uh, Bev and Ivy. And it's it's really a pleasure to be on a panel with such you know really expert and knowledgeable women. Um, a lot has been covered, and I think there's some amazing data that you've um, brought forward from Canada. And it's actually, uh, I think it, it's very powerful that you have such such data because in many countries we have almost no data whatsoever. Um, so in Women in Global Health, since the pandemic uh, started, Women in Global Health has, has launched a series of global policy research reports on gender equity and the health workforce. Um, we've done one on the design of medical PPE um, to see, see how far it's fit for women. Um, where we couldn't get data on what we know is, is um, a universal issue, sexual harassment and violence against women health workers, we launched a Health2 platform so that women could lodge their stories and we used those stories, um, the women's testimony as data. Um, and those are some pretty, I think, harrowing stories that, that we collected from all over the world. Um, we've looked into the status of um, millions of women who are working unpaid or grossly underpaid on the front lines um, in the health sector, mostly as community health workers in low middle income countries. And this year we've been focusing particularly on women's leadership, um, basing our research on the very diverse realities of our global of our 50 chapters and most recently we've been looking at what leadership actually means for those um, women on the front lines those community health workers which is a very interesting piece of work um, i thought what i'd do today is just give you six headlines that came from our recent publication um, the state of women and leadership in global health um, that we launched earlier this year and i thought i'd do that um, because as though it's global they actually apply the world over and I think they they chime with a number of things that um, Bev and Ivy has said. So our headline number one is that we can only understand the health workforce uh, when we take a gender lens. Um, as Bev and Ivy has said, health is a woman's profession. That's true globally. Uh, women are the, are the majority, but they're segregated into lower status, lower paid and often unpaid work. And that occupational segregation that Ivy has described so well is particularly marked um, in the health workforce and, and it's just about everywhere. Um, women made an exceptional contribution to health, social cohesion, the economy in the pandemic, but that contribution has not been rewarded by an equal say um, in decision-making or fair pay. Um, the report that, that we did this year on women's leadership found that the percentage of women in global health leadership has not changed in the last five years. It's still 25%. And these number, numbers matter um, because men still dominate in the very powerful positions that drive health priorities and budget allocations. Um, women are underrepresented in health leadership at global level, but women from low and middle income countries are particularly underrepresented. And we aim to change that. Second headline is that the pandemic has, ex has exacerbated existing gender inequalities for all women. So it's not that these things didn't exist before. Uh, it's just that uh, COVID at times has shone a spotlight um, on some of these existing um, gender inequalities and actually uh, increased inequality between and within countries on, on some indicators. So we saw uh, an increase in gender-based violence. Um, we, we've heard um, the Canadian example of women having to balance professional demands while bearing the brunt of caring responsibilities, which is a, you know, a, it's those are gendered responsibilities. And for women health workers, these additional burdens came at the same time as they were already dealing with, you know, very intense and often traumatic working conditions. And they were on top of the injustices. Um, unequal leadership, unfair pay, too little protection that women were already facing in their careers. Um, our third headline is that the concept of resilience can be toxic for women. Um, setting impossibly high standards and workloads for women causes ex exhaustion and burnout. Women, women everywhere are expected to be the social shock absorbers in a crisis. Um, our research looking at women's unpaid and underpaid work 
in health systems, found um, 6 million women, and we know there are more, uh, working unpaid and grossly underpaid in core health systems roles. Um, and the poorest women on the planet are effectively subsidizing um, global health with, with their unpaid labor. The majority of these women are community health workers. Um, we, we can track the impact of, of its work um, and they have quite a stunning positive impact on maternal and child health uh, indicators in, in many places. They are quite often the first and the only contact that a woman in the community will have with the health system. And they form the foundation for primary healthcare in, in many countries. But women's resilience has limits. Um, when we were talking to women who are working unpaid and underpaid, they're very much aware of the injustices they face and, and they're asking for change. Um, and it, as an example, in India, uh, which has a community health worker, CADA, which is an all female community health worker, CADA called the ASHA workers. That's nearly a million um, of, of those women community health workers. They went on strike um, for the first time and they got organized for the first time demanding better pay and working conditions. And they got an increase in pay, but they didn't get what, uh, what was their, their main goal. They didn't get their jobs recognized as formal sector jobs. So they're still working on task-based stipends outside the formal um, health sector, despite contributing to health sector goals. Um, our fourth headline from the Global Leadership Report is that a default male bias continues to undermine um, the status of women health workers. Um, and, and just to give you a, a, an example, um, we're still finding that um, maternity leave, paternity leave, parental leave um, in, in many countries is just simply absent or is just can't be actioned for women health workers. Um, but when you look at the health sector and you consider that the majority of, of workers are women, it makes absolutely no sense that human resources policies and systems are still designed on, on men and men's lives. In 2021, our research on the design and fit of medical PPE found that only 14% of women health workers had access to adequate PPE. And we collected numerous accounts of uh, medical PPE that was modeled on the male body um, that didn't fit or protect women or left women working in undignified um, working conditions. And that's really the default male bias. It, it, makes, it makes no sense. And yet it, it's still operating. Our headline number five is that sexual harassment of women health workers is extremely common and it's totally preventable. Um, and that can include everything from you know, abuse, verbal abuse, sexual exploitation uh, in, in many countries, assault and rape. Um, and it disproportionately impacts women health workers. Our research based on stories from women health workers found um, that it's, it's downplayed, it's rarely recorded, it's rarely reported, and it's rarely sanctioned. And quite often it's, it's normalized and women health workers are just, are just taught to go away and deal with it. Um, but the, the system does not expect that anything will be done about it. And what we found was um, that that there are repeat offenders. There are men that probably everyone in the system, you know, can identify um, and they will go on um, to abuse one woman um, after another. Um, and, and we can interrupt that cycle um, and we, we can stop it if the political will is there. Um, the costs of sexual harassment may appear to feel, uh, to fall largely on women who are victims, but our research also shows the very serious impact on health systems. Um, it affects women's morale, the health, their mental health, um, turnover, etc. Et and I think finally our headline number six is that um, basically women have had enough since the pandemic and they're leaving the sector. Um, we find that you know women are very, very proud of the contribution that they've made during COVID and the contribution they make in general. Um, but COVID was the last straw for many, many women health workers. 
Um, in the summer of 2021, in the UK, approximately 2% of the health workforce voluntarily resigned. And that was due to burnout caused by a combination of pandemic pressure and staff shortages. Um, and what, what we're seeing everywhere, but particularly in high income countries where it's being reported, is we're seeing burnout, moral injury, um, health workers feeling, feeling undervalued, um, and an exodus of health workers. And for women health workers, the pressures of the pandemic and what happened at, out at home as well, all came on top um, of the pressures they were already under in this highly segregated and un unequal workforce. Um, when the pandemic started, there was already an estimated 10 million global health worker shortage. And we know that was an underestimate and we know that's increased markedly since then. Um, and on top of that global shortage, health workers uh, uh, were incredibly unevenly distributed between countries and within countries. And that inequality has just got worse. And what we're seeing with this great resignation of you know, largely women health workers in high income countries is uh, the start of a great migration of health workers from low and middle income countries. Um, and those are the countries that should be protected. They have poorly resourced health systems, high burden of disease, and they're already very short of trained health workers. And there should be a, a far greater sense of urgency uh, about retention of trained health workers. I think we're hearing quite a lot about training new health workers. That's incredibly important. Um, but those trained health workers, if we start training them now, you know, they might come through the system in six or 10 years time. Um, but retention of the trained health workers that we've, we've got now um, has to be the most important issue. And that means addressing the gender inequities that women face in the health workforce. So in Women and Global Health, we believe that the pandemic should be treated as a break in history that demonstrated you know, the urgent need for gender transformative change uh, and the need for a new social contract for women health workers that is you know, finally based on gender and economic justice. We think we know what to do. Um, we've just got to push decision makers towards the political will to understand the crisis that we are, we are in now and that the health sector can be an exemplar. It could be uh, uh, the place where we demonstrate you know, how best to deal with gender equality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, and just um, really important points raised. And uh, I'm hoping we can have a discussion um, with some questions around, um, around um, a lot of these points, but thank you. Uh, I wanted to also recognize um, all that are joining us also globally. Um, it's really exciting to see um, other countries represented here as well. So just wanted to welcome you um, to, to our uh, event today. Um, one of the questions that did um, was raised, and I just wanted to see if I could, um, and this will be more pertaining to our Canadian landscape, and then we have another one that's more uh, globally focused, but just around um, the College of Family Physicians in the news lately and some work around primary care and the offering of um, prescriptions and um, and just wanted to see if maybe um, Bev or Ivy, you could speak to um, just the collaborative approach that was being discussed and uh, maybe elaborate a little more on that. Ivy, if that's okay, I'll start and then turn over to you. So this has recently come out. And so this is the College of Family Physicians. And just a reminder that primary care is family physicians and nurse practitioners. If I have easier access to the uh, family physician college information. So they've just prescribed a prescription for primary care because I think there is an awareness in Canada at all levels that we have a crisis. I get asked everywhere I go if I'm taking patients or do I know anyone? And uh, yeah, um, so a common question, a common issue. Um, so they've suggested a prescription. Um, the first one I'll leave for Ivy to talk about, which is moving to team-based care. The second is setting family medicine as a corner stone. So it's foundational to um, 
increase the capacity and expertise of colleagues, ensuring access for everyone. So having everyone in Canada have a primary care provider, investing in administrative support. So, you know, if family doctors and nurse practitioners are spending a lot of time uh, doing administrative work, then they're not seeing patients, they're not taking new patients. And I can share for myself that post-pandemic, my administrative workload each day without seeing a patient is 1.5 hours. That's seven days a week. So if I could, you know, and I work with an, a full-time admin, but there's just so much more that should I be provided with a team, they could assist with this. Um, providing fair remuneration uh, concerned with expertise and complexity, supporting full scope of practice, planning to meet community needs. And I think Ivy spoke about this, using digital solutions and integration and driving with more data. So I'll just turn over to Ivy now, because that's the broader prescription. Yeah, thank you. One of the pillars of the prescription for primary care from the College of Family Physicians of Canada is team-based primary care. And um, in part, there is an initiative called uh, Team Primary Care, TPC. Uh, I'll pop into the chat if you'd like to know a little bit more about that. Um, so this is an initiative that has been funded by Employment and Social Development Canada uh, to look at primary care writ large. And so um, it's, it, it's important to note that um, the CFPC's prescription was for primary care, and we're very inclusive at Team Primary Care of who is a primary care provider, family physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, pharmacists, midwives, you know, dental hygienists, dietitians, like we have over 20 plus groups around the table because everybody needs to be involved, all hands on deck for this crisis. And what's really important to note is that we have some people that are, that are burnt out and then we have some people that are inappropriately um, not utilized. And so we want to bring everybody to the table because one of the important factors around burnout is not having your role acknowledged and not being able to do the things that you've spent time and energy training for. And we as a public have also spent you know, public funding in your training, uh, in health worker training. So these are some of the issues that we're looking at. So we're trying to align training uh, around primary care, around all these different practitioners. And then we're also really trying to optimize team embedding principles of interprofessionalism, psychological health and safety, which is about more than just resilience and about more than just mental health. So how do we acknowledge everybody? Equity, diversity, inclusion, ensuring that we embed principles of truth and reconciliation into the way teams are working. So that's one arm of uh, the initiative. And we take very much uh, an inclusive approach um, and uh, I'm really pleased to be co-leading that with another Ivy, Ardio Anderson, uh, from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And um, uh, always a great idea to match two Ivies were formidable. Thanks so much, Ivy. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, another question that did come in um, was around um, both in Canada and globally, have any of you sort of when you think about are we moving the needle at all or are we seeing any programs that are starting to address as we're just discussing right now, um, in addition to some of these, um, all of the different prongs of this issue um, that we're seeing and again if there's you know from the Canadian context but also obviously um, worldwide is there any best practices or kind of note to self and kind of, um, you know, kind of maybe initiatives to follow where we can all learn from each other as we try and, um, and you know, to, uh, to address this uh, huge issue. And I don't know if anyone wants to just, you know, I, I yeah. can, I can begin and it really is riffing off of what, you know, Anne has said. Um, it's very much a situation of two steps forward, two steps back. Uh, the pandemic has really put things back. Um, you know, just, it was just so remarkable how everything just became so incredibly gendered along traditional gender roles in terms of who stayed home, did what. You know, we were just even looking at dis distribution of health workforce research, you know, and disproportionately um, health workforce researchers are women. And we know that there was a general trend in women's research capacity lowering during the pandemic. 
And we saw that um, in our in our literature in Canada, there were fewer studies published in 2020 than in 2019, 18, 2021, and 2022 on health workforce issues, despite the fact that we were in the middle of a health workforce crisis. Um, and so I think, and you know, um, Eva's also asked in, in, in the chat about data. And I, I, I don't think that it's gonna be data that convince people because we have been showing data over and over and over again. And people are just like, yeah, that's really awful. What can we do about it? Oh my God, that's really terrible. And I think it's really very much what women in global health are saying, we need to get women in leadership positions and we need to get them into those positions fast because, and we need to make sure that they are, because again, not all women leaders are ne necessarily making decisions that are in the best interests of women. So we have to really put the pressure on. So it needs to be a multiple intervention strategy, but we have to push really hard. And it's not just about the data, it's about really thinking strategically what are the things that we need to push when and where uh, and, and, and move that? If I can share just one short anecdote, because we gave like really good data to our House of Commons Standing Committee on Health around the state of the health workforce. So much data about we need to be planning. This is definitely gendered. Um, you know, you wrote a report like three years prior to this other report about violence. And none of none of those recommendations were implemented. Just even rec just even a public education campaign about violence against women. Just your top recommendation from 2019. Could you do that? The report came out, and the first recommendation is that we're going to create better pathways for internationally educated health workers, and we're going to recruit from countries that don't need their health workers, that they have a surplus of health workers. Forgetting all of the data that were presented about the political economy of the migration, and that the reason why there are underemployed health workers in countries is because of the global political economy. So mm -hmm. there's no ethical, ethically okay way to be recruiting from countries that have lower resources than you do. Yet that was the number one recommendation of 20. Oh. It's absolutely appalling. And um, and I, I think it's, you know, important that we also, you know, continue to raise some of these types of discussions that we know are just completely, um, you know, in the wrong direction of where we need to be moving. So um, yeah, thank you for that, Ivy. Is there any other thoughts from Bev or Anne on any kind of best practices that we've seen or any countries that are moving the needle or at least, you know, um, anything we can learn from? Uh, sure. Uh, I think, you know, there, there are a number of um, low and middle income countries uh, who did much better on the pandemic than many, many other um, high income countries. And I don't think that we had the humility to uh, to think that we had anything to to learn. There's a big inquiry on the pan pandemic going on now, um, but none of that learning um, is is even being is even being sought. So I think we we had some really good examples during the pandemic of um, community based approaches um, to to pandemic sort of management um, that have, that have worked very well. And I think um, countries like Ethiopia. Um, that had already formalized their cadre of um, women community, community health workers were in a better position to, to respond. So there are countries like Ethiopia that have, um, that, that have good experience on having formalized um, those cadres of workers. It's not, a, I can't really think about, think of any country that's got a, a totally great record because having, formalized that cadre and brought them in that that cadre of women into the um formal health sector and they've got you know paid jobs and benefits and all the rest of it they then created alongside another volunteer cadre which which are women working alongside the now the now paid health workers so um it's it's a great story with a, another story alongside it um the story of the pakistan um health workers and i know we have someone on the line from from um the uh, from Pakistan, the, the Pakistan Lady Health Workers. Um, that program is, if if I'm right, it's it's around 30 years 30 years old. Um, and as as it sounds, it's an all women cadre of community health workers um, designed particularly to take 
services to women's doorsteps where women have got restricted mobility. Um, that, that has been, in a way, it's become the backbone of the health system. Um, those women started off um, sort of officially being paid, but, but, general, but quite often not, not being paid. Um, and gradually through, through actually through organizing, um, they, have, they have improved their, their conditions. Um, and I think that that is a good example. And, and it's a good example of where um, health workers, women health workers have got organized um, in order to, to get better conditions. That's quite a hard thing to do for community health workers because they're um, dispersed. Um, then they're, they're not in not generally in a in a clinic or a hospital it's much harder to organize but I, I think this um, you know the moves towards collective action and we saw a lot more of that in the pandemic we saw strikes of health workers in over a hundred countries um, so I think we, we I don't know if that's going to continue um, but but it's it's interesting I think to think think much more about that collective action and in a way women in global health is also an example of of collective action um, with with women in the health sector um, providing you know support lessons information etc to to each other so yeah um, there are some some good examples out there thank you very much for that Anne and I was um... I remember the Pakistan, the lady health workers looking at the excellence of that program years ago. And so sort of using that as, you know, as we look at the, you know, kind of, you know, community health workers and how incredibly um, integral they are worldwide in um, health systems and such. And that is a, a shining example. I remember the first studies when they were looking at that concept and that many years ago so um i yeah completely agree with you and i at the world health assembly just um last month a lot of the community health workers stood up and really vocalized you know that they cannot go on like this you know with this unpaid work and the type of work that they're doing and how integral they know they are in our in our communities yeah. worldwide and i was really it was really great to see them stand and just take a you know have a voice and uh and, and be there and I hope that we can see more of that as well as we continue also to raise, yeah, raise those messages and such. Um, but thank you for that. Oh, unbelievably, it looks like we are <laughs> at time. I think we could all keep talking about this for uh, for quite some time. And I really wanted to thank our panel um, today for um, you know bringing you know um, bringing this to the forefront. Um, it's really important, very timely, as we say, we've been talking about this for many years, but now really to capitalize on what we've learned and let's try and get some, you know, some movement and some change worldwide. Um, I wanted to thank everyone who's joined us as well. And again, everyone also internationally, I know you're on different time zones. So just huge respect to you for being here with us. And hopefully for Women in Global Health Canada, this will be uh, one of very of many events that we'll have to continue to kind of uh, raise the voice on this. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, wishing you um, great parts of your day wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.